my pleasure and honor to welcome you to Edmonton and open the Botany 2015 conference on behalf of Plan Canada, its member societies, Botanical Society of America, and U.S. participating societies. I would like to acknowledge that Botany 2015 is being held on Cherokee Six First Nation land, the traditional territory of the Cree, Nakuta, and Metis people of the Northern Prairies. You may know that this is the first, this is the fifth Plan Canada meeting, which is normally set every four years, and normally the six member societies attend the national meeting. However, this meeting is very special to us because we are joining our scientists in the southern border, and we are attempting to set an international meeting with several societies. One of the reasons that Plan Canada put this meeting together was to encourage the members of the plant, Canadian Plant Science Societies, to meet on a regular basis, to organize and sponsor scientific meeting and workshop under the national umbrella for plant science and related discipline in Canada. By joining these forces together, the group can offer one large meeting with numerous invited speakers and a special event, and this year we are fortunate to have several Swiss, U.S. societies as a partner, and I'm sure it further creates a louder voice and maintain a strong communication network among participating societies and the individual member societies nationally and internationally. There are currently six member societies under Plan Canada, and we are joining seven U.S. societies, and I'm fortunate to introduce the president of each participating societies, and I would like the president come up to the stage when your name is called. Starting with Plan Canada member societies, Canadian Botanical Association's John Markham, Canadian Canadian Phytopathological Society, Dina Rampalini. Canadian Society of Agronomy, Brian Bress. I believe Brian couldn't make it. Canadian Society for Horticultural Science, Samir Debnap. Canadian Society for the Plant Biologist, Vincento De Luca. Canadian Wheat Science Society, Eric Johnson, is being presented by Linda Hall. I don't know if Linda could make it or not. There are also seven U.S. societies involved in this meeting with a significant input into this conference, and it is a privilege to introduce their president. I would appreciate if you can come up also in front when your name is called. American Biological and Lincolnological Society, Dr. John Shaw. The American First Society, J. Eddie Watkins. American Society of Plant Taxonomies, Pat Hannardin. <laughs> Botanical Society of America, Tom Ranker. <laughs> International Association for Plant Taxonomy, Vicky Funk, is going to be presented by Carol Merhold.
Mycological Society of America, Jane Lodge. The Society of the Herbarium Curator, Andrea Wicks. And uh, after introducing the society, I really would like to acknowledge the work of many volunteers that work hard for many years to put this meeting together. And this meeting would not be set up as is without the dedication and hard work of many people. And I have this opportunity to mention a few names, and I'm sorry if I miss any name. Can you please stand up and raise your hand where your name is called? Amy Liet. Harvey Baylor. Larry Sankler. Don Doron. Bill Dahl. Joanne Stobran. and the Botanical Society of Staff, and from Plant Canada, and from Plant Canada, John Markham, Diane Edward, Dina Arampleni, Anya Gateman, Frederick Grunel, Janice Cook, Jocelyn Hall, Stefan Strolko, and Karen Tenino. These people dedicated their time on the top of their very busy schedule to set up the program and the details of the meeting. And also a special thanks goes to Diane Hockland, who organized the field trips. I also have one little announcement to make. Uh, Plan Canada, as you know, is not a very uh, old federation. It's established about around 2000. And one of the persons that was uh, at the beginning with this federation was Dr. Carol Peterson, that was working and dedicating her, her job and, and her, her time to Plan Canada as a treasurer, secretary, and president. And finally, this year, Carol decided to retire after 15 years. Uh, I don't know if Carol is here or not. If you are, please stand up. Thank you so much, Carol, for all you did for Plan Canada. We wouldn't be here without hardworking people like you. I wish you a great stay in Edmonton and hope that you while you're here, you can enjoy some of the sights in this wonderful city. I'm sure you will not only benefit from the wonderful program that has been put together by the organizing committee, but will also enjoy the Alberta hospitality. Wish you a fruitful meeting and a wonderful stay in Alberta. Thank you. Uh, I would, this time, I would like to introduce John Markham, who is going to introduce the speakers. John? Thank you very much. 
when it fell to me to uh, select a speaker for a plenary talk for a conference this large, it was obvious that what we needed was someone who could talk to a very, very broad audience in terms of botany and mycology. And one of the themes that I know all of our societies um, strive towards is communicating what we do. And I think we do, over the years, we've gotten much better at doing a very good job of communicating the importance of botany uh, and mycology. But I think one area that we, we continually strive to work towards is trying to communicate to the general public why botany and mycology is such a fascinating area, why we have chosen this as a career path. And so going through lists of people that could be a good plenary speaker, it became quite obvious that the speaker that we are very uh, lucky to have tonight, uh, Dr. Ken Thompson, would be an obvious choice. If you're a plant ecologist, you probably know Ken Thompson's name. Uh, Ken spent the better part of his career at the uh, Unit of Comparative Plant Ecology at the University of Sheffield. But during that time, uh, Ken also led a bit of a double life. Um, he would lecture to uh, gardening groups and wrote uh, regular articles on gardening uh, in the UK. More recently, uh, Ken has published a number of books, both on gardening, but also on the importance and our understanding of biodiversity. Um, and if any of you are interested in trying to um, start to do some writing of popular science, um, I would really recommend that you go uh, and take a look at uh, Ken's articles uh, in the UK newspaper, The Telegraph. Um, he's the only person I know who can write entertaining articles on the naming of plants. Um, so um, without further ado, uh, if, could you please join me in welcoming uh, Ken Thompson to give us our plenary talk. Um, I have uh, two grown-up sons. Well, they're fairly grown-up. Intelligent, I think, well-adjusted young men, both of them, but not botanists. So when I was thinking about what to say to you today, I went to them and I said, what What's the first thing that comes into your mind when I say the word botany? And one of them said right away, shampoo. <laughs> and the other said, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know this. I, I know this. Gin. And of course, they're both, they're both completely right. Um, there's some very, very botanical gin. And when it comes to shampoo, well, what can I say? A degree in plant taxonomy is scarcely enough to understand the labels of some bottles of shampoo these days. There are plants there that I've never heard of, that's for sure. But at least gin and shampoo are reasonably positive associations of plants. And you might argue it's better than not thinking about plants at all. We are sometimes exhorted to think about plants in a very negative way. Um, and let me give you an example. In the UK, we don't really have much of, a, of an invasive plant species problem. But you wouldn't know that if you read the Daily Mail. I don't quite know what to say about the Daily Mail to an American audience. except to say that I, I think you don't have an exact equivalent, and you're, and you're quite lucky. It's a national newspaper, 
uh, which, which seems to have the rather counterproductive ambition of scaring all its readers to death. If you read, some, you probably can't read the text from where you're sitting, but the, the hyperbole of this article is astonishing. And notice the well-chosen photograph, which is meant to imply that the guy in the spacesuit is somehow in some danger from the Japanese knotweed. What he's actually in danger from is the herbicide he's trying to spray the Japanese knotweed with, of course. The male's ambition seems to be that we should all go to bed at night and be unable to sleep for fear of waking up in the morning and finding the world has been taken over by Japanese knotweed. And once you start to believe what the male tell you about Japanese knotweed, you rapidly enter a downward spiral of, um, of despair, debt, <laughs> and uh, ultimately, of course, and rather sadly, death. This is, this is all, of course, nonsense. There is no prohibition on lending to properties that have Japanese knotweed in the garden. The bloke in the picture with the house that was going to be knocked down, his house was not knocked down, of course. And although this guy really did kill his wife and then himself, um, Japanese knotweed had nothing to do with it. In fact, he didn't even have Japanese knotweed on his property. What killed him was reading about Japanese knotweed in the Daily Mail. <laughs> However, putting all that uh, behind us, it's, <clears throat> it's pretty easy, actually, if you can just persuade people to sit down and listen, it's really quite easy to persuade people that plants are important. That, that we depend entirely on plants. And fungi, of course. That every breath of air, every glass of water, every mouthful of food comes ultimately from plants that these ecosystem services that we are told about so much these days are not, in fact, ecosystem services. That's giving ecosystems too much credit. They are, in fact, plant services. It's easy to convince people of that. But that's not the problem. We don't just have to convince people that plants are important. We have to we have to convince people that plants are cool, that plants are exciting and interesting and fascinating. And that's much more difficult. Because we don't work on plants because they're important. We think plants are important. We know plants are important. But we work on plants because we like them, because we find them interesting and absorbing and fascinating. Now, any, any fool can be impressed or fascinated by, by birds, for example. <laughs> it takes an intelligence of an entirely different order to appreciate plants, I think, because plants are so obviously boring. They don't do anything, do they? They just sit there, doing nothing. But convincing people that plants are cool, even that, difficult as it is, is not the hardest task. What we have to convince people is not just that plants are cool, but that botany is cool. 
Because again, I make the point that plants are so obviously boring, there can't be anything left to discover about them, can there? You just need to look at them to see that. And I'm sure that's what most people think. Who is going to do that? Who is going to go out there and tell people that plants really are interesting and fascinating and in fact we know surprisingly little about them, even today? Who is going to do that? I'm not sure. In the UK, an increase in undergraduate applications for courses on, in um, astronomy and physics has been put down to the success of movies such as Interstellar, Gravity, and The Theory of Everything. But I don't think Hollywood is going to come to our rescue. I'm not holding my breath for Indiana Jones and the Herbarium of Doom. <laughs> In fact, literature and the arts are part of the problem not part of the solution, sadly. Ever since the time of Jane Austen, at least, giving a character in a book an interest in plants has been standard shorthand for making him or her a character who needs not to be taken seriously. If there's a botanist, in a movie, he's there for, he or she is there for one of two reasons. He's either there for comic relief, or he is destined to be eaten by the crocodile before the end of the first reel. So what about the traditional interpreters of science for the, for the masses, science journalists? I'm not sure we can trust them to do the job either. Let me give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> and I, and I, I, I apologize now for mentioning uh, fairly briefly some of my own actual work. I promise I won't do it again. We all know about hard seeds water impermeable seeds. We know that they're quite common in some plant families, especially the legumes. And we know that they have profound, especially ecological consequences. Here, for example, is a nice paper from quite a few years ago now, with lots of citations with the oldest documented living plant seed, the sacred lotus, 1,300 years old. And the reason it seems to have survived that long is because it's a hard seed. It's been hermetically sealed that whole time inside a watertight coating. So, water impermeable seed coats has a major effect on longevity of seeds. It has a major effect on germination timing. And the assumption has been, <clears throat> as far as I can tell, for at least a century, that that's why hard seeds evolved. That regulation of germination is what and perhaps increasing longevity, is what hard seeds are all about. But it's not. And I know it's not because I and a few friends published a paper a couple of years ago now, 
which says it's not. Hard seeds are there to reduce predation. Because what an impermeable seed coat does is it completely prevents the seed from releasing any of the volatile compounds that small mammals use to detect seeds in the soil, which they cannot see, but they can smell. Once a seed is in an impermeable seed coat, it becomes effectively invisible to those seed predators. Hard seeds are the stealth bombers of the plant world. And this gives me an opportunity to show you our experimental animal, which is the cutest animal you'll ever see. The desert hamster. Now, and, and the more people who work on germination tell me that this is a stupid idea, the more I know it's right. So, given that it was published in a decent journal, given that it was an editor's choice in science, although the sods wouldn't actually publish the paper, but we'll pass over that, you would think, would you not, given that this overturns a hundred years of received wisdom on the subject of germination, and something that everyone knows, something that everyone learns at school, that every gardener knows, you would think, would you not, there would have been some interest in this paper. Some. Just a little. One example. One newspaper article, one blogger, one something. As far as I can tell, no one has taken the slightest notice at all. Am I bitter about that? <laughs> Not at all. Or at least no more, no more bitter than I normally am. Let me give you another example. Because even if science journalists see a story that they know is interesting, they don't necessarily get it right. Drops of water on leaves. And if you're a gardener, one of the first things you learn, practically at your mother's knee, is, as the Royal Horticultural Society says, so it must be true, those water droplets will act as little lenses focusing the sun and scorching the leaves. Everyone knows this. Every gardener knows this. But like a lot of things every gardener knows, it hadn't until recently actually been tested. Until this paper, again in the New Phytologist. Now what this paper says, if you read it, well, it says two things. It reports empirical experiments trying to scorch leaves with water drops, which turns out to be virtually impossible. And it also tells you about the optics of water drops on leaves and demonstrates that it's logically impossible to burn leaves with water drops. So how was this reported? Now you're thinking, of course, that's the Daily Mail again. We've learnt now not to pay any attention to the Daily Mail. But it's not just the Daily Mail, it's everybody.
It even got as far as the European Commission. I don't know why the European Commission are interested in water drops on leaves, but apparently they are. And they all say the same thing. Why do they all say the same thing? Well, the problem here, and I think the Horvath brothers who wrote this paper have been kicking themselves ever since they published it, is the title. Because bear in mind that 99.9% .9 of people will read only the title. A tiny number of people may read the summary. And maybe five will read the paper itself. And the problem with this paper is the title says effectively that water drops on leaves scorch leaves in sunlight. And even if you read the summary, it's not completely clear. But that's not the case. To get the true message, you actually have to read the whole paper quite carefully right through. Then you discover that what it actually means is it's impossible. So this is just a word of warning when you're writing a paper, if you're writing a paper about a subject that you think might be of interest to the public, and secondly, you think might be misinterpreted, and that includes anything, make sure the title is absolutely explicit. This is, this is a good title. This is a good title. You don't need to read that. You don't need to read the abstract. Well, there isn't one, but if there were, you wouldn't need to read it. You don't really need to read the whole title. Just the first four words will do. No one could misunderstand that. Ginkgo biloba does nothing. Yeah, that's it. May not be strictly true, actually, but as far as the evidence reported in this review, that looks like it. So, journalists. We can't trust journalists. We are going to have to tell people that plants are cool and that botany is cool ourselves. And that's what I've been doing for about five years now in the pages of one of Britain's uh, best-selling daily newspapers, the Daily Telegraph. This one, for example, reveals to gardeners the startling fact that plants have sex. You'd be surprised how many people don't know that. Not only do they have sex, they have sexes. In other words, although most plants are hermaphrodite, some of them are like us. They have males and females. So the hook for this article was, what happens if only one of those sexes is moved from one country to another country. What happens when that single sex finds itself all alone in a new habitat without its mate? And the answer is, obviously, it depends enormously on what plant it is. Japanese knotweed that we were talking about earlier does very well indeed. Despite in the UK being only a single sex, and not only only a single sex, but only a single genotype. Despite there being quite a lot of Japanese knotweed in the UK, all of it is a single female clone. Every single plant. In fact, it's remarkable that a plant with no obvious dispersal mechanism, other than human stupidity, seems to be doing very well indeed. Fortunately, human stupidity is not in short supply in the UK. <laughs> Back to the sacred lotus, telling people here about how the structure and chemical composition of leaves of some plants leads to them being very efficient at shedding water and also pollutants.
starting from the viewpoint that everyone's interested in horsetail because it's such a bad weed, I tell people about how exciting spore dispersal is in horsetails and in ferns. Both have wonderful mechanisms. Explaining to people gently but firmly why looking at DNA of plants is going to mean that their favorite plant changes its name, but that it won't happen again. <laughs> they just have the misfortune to be living through the time when it is happening. And one of my favorites, reporting the changes to the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature that allow plants new plant species at last to be described in English and no longer in Latin. So my mission at the Telegraph, while allegedly writing about gardening, is to smuggle some real science into the minds of British gardeners. Now, why have I chosen gardening? Many reasons. One is because I'm interested in gardening, so I find it relatively easy to do. Also, Britons are a nation of gardeners. The way to an Englishman's heart is not through his stomach or even through his wallet, but through his garden. And also, that gardening reaches an audience that's probably bigger than the audience for science, and also a very different audience. Lots of people are happy to read about gardening who would tell you that they were not remotely interested in science. So they're being educated in the best possible way without noticing that it's happening. And they're learning along the way, I hope, from what I tell them, not just that science is a body of knowledge, which is what most people think science is, but that it's actually a way of looking at and understanding the universe, which is a more useful lesson. What I often do is I actually start with and write about a specific paper this is one of my recent favorites. My old mate, Hans Cornelissen, and friends of his, who've taken one of these giant databases of plant traits that are now starting to appear all over the place, and simply looked at the distribution of the simplest plant trait of them all, plant height. How is that distributed? I had always assumed it was probably just a nice bell-shaped curve and that the plants we call trees were just one end of that curve and the plants we call shrubs were in the middle or something. But it turns out that's not true. It turns out that actually the distribution of plant height is bimodal. Trees and shrubs are not human constructs, they actually exist. And between trees and shrubs, there's a gap with relatively few species. Isn't that amazing? I was amazed. So, I tell people that. This is a lovely paper, Annals of Botany. Annals of Botany, a happy hunting ground for interesting stuff to write about for gardeners, I find about variegation. Of course, all gardeners know about variegation because they grow variegated plants. And many variegated plants work on the principle of having bits of leaves with pigments in and bits of leaves without pigments in. But what this paper says is variegation is not all about pigments. Some of it is about leaf structural modification. So this is an opportunity to tell people some interesting botany not just some interesting botany, but some interesting physics as well.
course, you can't trust journalists. Not only can you not trust journalists, you can't trust newspaper picture editors either. This is meant to be a begonia. It says, the variegated leaves of begonia rex. Of course, it's not a begonia. It's a coleus. But there you are. And I just had to write about the holes in Swiss cheese plants. Because everyone knows about Swiss cheese plants. Everyone has one dying in the corner of the office. Why do they have holes in? So I had to write about it. Even though, I have to say, the paper from which I stole my article, in American Naturalist, every time I read it, I'm less sure I understand what it's actually saying. Maybe it's authors here. If he is, he can take me on one side afterwards and tell me what it says. Here's a nice paper. And I say that not just because it's in my journal, the journal I edit, for the British Ecological Society. It's about lianas. Popular lifestyle for plants. Many woody plants in the tropics are lianas. Huge number of species, very diverse. The reason lianas are so successful is they can be big plants without needing to waste any energy on holding themselves up. So they can have nice narrow stems filled not with support tissue, but just with xylem. And not only that, not very tough xylem. Xylem with very wide vessels so they can transport water very quickly and very easily to the tops of canopies with almost no investment. But what this tells us, which is an idea which has been around for a while but rarely tested, is that a problem with that architecture is that it's very susceptible to freeze-thaw embolism. So as soon as you get into a climate where you're likely to freeze in the winter, it doesn't work very well. And they prove that that's actually the case by comparing a bunch of lianas and a bunch of plants from the same forest in Chile. So it's a nice story. But to make it even nicer, you need a bit of a... You need a wrinkle, you need some spin. So the obvious one I came up with is one of the main consumers of lianas. Tarzan, asking the question, why is Tarzan tropical? Why is there not a temperate Tarzan? Well, the obvious reason, of course, is that dressed like that, you wouldn't last very long around here in the winter, would you? But the botanical reason is that Tarzan's mode of transport, which he's holding onto in that picture, basically doesn't exist in temperate woodlands. He couldn't travel. Just occasionally, very rarely, to a large extent because my editor at the Telegraph just doesn't let me get away with it, I do make a political point as when I was enraged about our stupid government reducing funding for science at Kew Gardens. But I don't do that very often. Because people want to be entertained, not lectured to. And to conclude, um, did I take the opportunity of putting right the story about plant sunburn. Indeed, I did. So, let me finish with the coolest botanical picture I could find rummaging through my collection of pictures. Kew Gardens in the snow.
Thank you very much.